Cool. Um, well, again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I am really excited about doing these houseplant webinars because it's really fun to just kind of, they give me a prompt and they're like, create a houseplant oasis. And then I just get to come up with whatever I want to talk about and um, pick some cool plants and give you some cool tips and then just kind of do whatever um, I think the community might want to hear and maybe what you want to see. So um, definitely as we do some questions, if you have some ideas for upcoming classes or some other topics you want to know about, let us know. We use those uh, definitely when creating our schedule. But again, yeah, we're right now creating a houseplant oasis. And so I really wanted to take a second to just think about when you think of an oasis, what do you actually think of? Like, what is the first image that comes to your mind? Most of us, me at least, uh, you think of a place in a desert. You think of a desert all around, and then you have this one concentrated, dense foliage, beautiful area with lush growth, with water, with life that's surrounded by an area that maybe is not so much life or not the same kind of life. Um, and I think that's really interesting when thinking about a houseplant oasis because we are bringing plants into our homes that usually would actually not do that great in the area around us. Um, at least where I live right now, I'm in California, I'm in San Francisco, and a lot of us are probably in California. We are bringing houseplants into our homes that are actually tropical plants. There are a couple of exceptions. There's all different kinds of plants, of course, out there, but we're bringing in tropical plants. So things from uh, regions that are closer to the equator uh, that have warmer and more rainforest style growth. And so we are creating a little oasis inside our homes of these kinds of plants that would not actually grow as well outside in our normal environment, in our normal yards and everything like that. Um, but we're actually making this nice little pocket of lush growth inside our house. Um, I am definitely someone who also likes to cover every surface with a plant. As you can see right behind me, this is just what my room actually kind of looks like normally. I change things around pretty consistently. I move plants from here to there. Um, I really try and give them the right amount of lighting, the right amount of care. And so that does require me to move them around a little bit more. And as I figure it out, you know, I'm never, I don't know everything right away. It's, it's all trial and error. So they're all moving around, but honestly, I will cover any surface I have. I have many desks in my room <laughs> uh, and they're all, they all have plants on them. There's plants up the walls. I'm getting a lot more hanging plants. I think last class that we had for uh, house plants earlier for, at the end of last year. I talked a lot about hanging plants and talked a lot about trailing plants because I really wanted to give the idea of if you're going to add more plant volume to your space, um, sometimes you got to go up and sometimes you got to come down from up high. Um, today, one of our topics that I really want to go into is climbing plants. And so I think in, in an oasis kind of style place, um, you don't have just one layer of plants all around the floor. You have plants growing up trees, you have plants growing on walls, you have different levels, everything's kind of clustered together. It's creating like a nice homogenous, or not homogenous, very biodiverse area um, of foliage and growth. And so when you walk into it, you feel like, wow, there's life here, there's a lot going on. And that's the feeling I want you to kind of look towards when you, when, when you make your little oasis in your house. So um, the other kind of main topic I wanna to really go into, and I'm gonna kind of go into throughout the entire talk um, is water. And so the three different things that plants need there's a lot of different things, but three main things are your water, your light, and your nutrients. And so light is a really important thing that we always talk about. I have a very bright room, and I always recommend if you're trying to put a plant somewhere, the first thing you got to think about is, where is this light coming from? Where is it going to get its photosynthesis going? Because the light is actually the energy of the photosynthesis. Um, the nutrients in the soil is just kind of keeping it growing. It gives it all the different kind of chemicals and compounds that it needs to make all of its structures. And then the water, is its life force. It's, it's, it's the lifeblood of your plant. It's something that's gonna be running through the entire plant. All the cells need water. They need it to break down and do photosynthesis. They need it to do respiration, do all these different kinds of things. Water is very important. It's very important to us and very important to plants, of course. And when you think of an oasis, I always think of like a little pool in the middle of it. Like it's an area that has a lot of access to water. And so when you have a place in your house that you are growing a lot of plants, you wanna make sure, along with the light, you wanna make sure you have a lot of access to water. Um, it's really important to have, um, I have a bunch of watering cans. I have a bunch of buckets around my room that are, I've collected rainwater and brought them in. Um, and I think we had a class about last week that was all about collecting rainwater and using it, which is wonderful. And I really hope that some of you were able to watch that. And if you haven't, go check it out on our YouTube page. Um, and our, I think our Water Our World did that one. And it's all about bringing in or using the water that we have coming down, especially we just had a huge rainstorm. It's still going on. I think it's about to rain soon. Uh, and all that can be kind of collected and be used over a smaller period of time for the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to be using it for my houseplants. So having access to water is wonderful. 
Um, but also I really wanna kind of put it into your mind. How does water move through the system? How does water actually move through the plant? How is it uptaking it? How is it being released? Um, because I think that's also very important when you're growing a lot of plants is thinking about where is the water actually going and where is it actually coming from? So um, some interesting things that we could talk about today um, are different kinds of watering methods. So if many of us, I'm sure, use like a watering can. This is one of the basic watering cans that we have at Slope. Uh, we have a bunch of different kinds. I am actually a collector of watering cans because they're great. And I just, when I find a cool new one, I'll usually pick it up. But um, having one around, I have it filled with water right now. Like I said, it's from rainwater. So it is ready to go. I'm ready to use it. Also spray bottles are a great way of applying water to your plants. I have a really big one that is for pump action, which I can show you how it works later, as well as a small one for just smaller kind of spraying around. And so I think it's an interesting kind of idea that a lot of people have been talking about in the plant community right now on the uh, use and the valid validity of misting and spraying. And I think there's a lot of different topics on both sides of saying that is it really important to spray? Is it really not important to mist? You know, stuff like that. Um, and I am someone who will mist constantly. I will mist all the time. I do a lot of that um, in my in my space, in my room. Um, but I think it's less of a, just trying to create a dense humidity. Uh, humidity happens with that water from the spray, but also the more plants you have around, the more that they're clustered together, they actually kind of release water together because water is being taken up from their soil or from their growing medium through the plant. It's being used as it's going and then it hits the top of the leaves and it's actually evaporating or being pulled out by wind or sun or whatever the, the component be is they're actually being pulled out and it's creating a little bit of humidity around your plants. So if you actually have a bunch of plants in the same area and you do a little bit of water misting or you also have like little trays of water, you can kind of actually create a nice amount of humidity, which a lot of these plants really like. Um, but I actually spray my plants quite often because I feel like it connects me to them a little bit more when I'm actually spraying them and when I'm watering them. I'm also checking on the leaves and looking around and making sure the soil is doing okay. I'm definitely checking on the back sides of the leaves because that's where you find all your bug problems. If you're someone who struggles with bug problems or uh, is worried about them, always check on the back sides of your leaves pretty consistently. They will sneak up on you. It's very surprising how sometimes you can walk away for uh, a couple days or so and then you come back and the plant has a bunch of bugs on it and you're like, oh, how'd that happen? You just need to continue, consistently check on them, clean them off. Using spray is also a good way to just kind of wipe them off or get them away. Um, but also I use misting and spraying to hydrate the uh, growing medium. So I will hydrate the top of the soil. If I feel like it's a very dry soil, uh, a lot of times it becomes slightly hydrophobic, which means that it will repel the water. It won't drain or won't penetrate through the soil very easily without being a little bit wet first because water has those amazing uh, com or, um, hydrogen bonds. That means that when they're actually connected, water can move through a system really easily. So if something is, has hydration in it, water moves up and down it really well, uh, where if it's actually very, very dry, it takes a while for the water to actually kind of break through those cells and, and hydrate the whole system. So I use this pretty consistently on my plants. Um, I really want to go in and actually give you a kind of not a tour, but I want to show off one of my plants uh, that I have here. It's called a Raphidophora hayi. Um, it is a really beautiful climbing plant because like I said, I really want to talk about climbing plants today. And this is my best example of one. So these are plants that will grow up a pole or up a medium or some sort of structure. They want to climb up. And so I remember talking about last week, I talked about trailing plants and a lot of them have these kind of vining structures that on the vining structure have maybe a little node right under each leaf. And, and the node that under each leaf is actually an area where a root can grow. And I was mentioning that a lot of times those roots will grow out and attach to things. They're actually ones that will attach to the sides of mostly trees in, the, in their actual growing habitat and they grow up the sides of those trees or even rocks. Um, and as they're attaching up, they're is taking in the water that is on the tree because it's probably very misty or very wet or it's had a rainstorm recently. And that will actually be able for the plant to be able to take in that water from its, its upward uh, leaf nodes and all of its uh, roots at the top, as well as the soil root system is, uh, that it's able to take the water to. So this is a Raphidora, Raphidophora hayi. Um, it's a pretty amazing name and everyone says it a little bit differently. 
I have it right now growing up a pole that I made. Um, it's a bamboo pole that I actually cut in half and then stuck sphagnum moss all throughout the inside of it and then attached a, and then planted the plant at the bottom of it. So when I bought, got this plant, it was only a yay tall. It was very small, it was really cute. It was just kind of shingling up the side of a little wood plank that it came with. Um, and I was noticing that pretty immediately, the top of the plant was growing over the wall, over the little kind of um, plank that it was growing on. And so I thought, well, I can't leave it here. The thing is, a climbing plant will become a trailing plant when it doesn't have something to climb on. Um, and I can even show you here, I've had this growing on here for I think, uh, two or so years now, and it finally made it all the way to the top. It's a beautiful little shingling plant. And then it got to the top and now it's going sideways. It hit the top and now it's going this way. And so what it's doing right now is instead of growing towards the light, which most, most plants, when you actually plant them and you put them near a, a lighting situation, they will grow towards the sun. But a lot of these really specifically climbing plants that really just wanna climb, they will grow away from the sun, which is bizarre, but it's because they're trying to find another surface to go up and then continue to have more height, which will give them more sun in the long run. So it's right now going backwards, not even getting any sunlight because it's growing away from the sun, and, but it's trying to go up again. So something I really wanna do with these is actually propagate them. Cause like I said, I really like this plant and I would like to get more of them. And I have done that. And let me show you the, another example of it. So here is another of the same plant, Staraphophora hayi. I have these bottom leaves, if you can see it, they're got these air plants out of the way. I have these bottom leaves on the ground. So these are the, um, the leaves that I took cuttings. So I took cuttings from that plant a little while ago, maybe like maybe about a year or so. And I, I put them in sphagnum moss. And I'm gonna show you, I'm actually gonna trim that one that we just talked about so I can show you how you can propagate it because I think that's a really good care tip for these plants and care tip in general. And also it just kind of hopefully alleviates some nervousness that people have with trimming their plants because I think trimming your plants is very important for their healthy growth as well as it, they look really nice and you can make more of them because propagation is amazing. Um, so I actually have these original plants or these leaves at the bottom that I just stuck down here and I have a plank of wood. I didn't really have any access to moss poles a little while ago. We're getting more of them now at Slope. So if you're interested in coming in and getting some moss poles, definitely check in with all of our stores. But right now I just had a plank of wood and I, I wrapped some sphagnum moss with some twine that I also got there. Um, and then I actually had the plant starting to grow up it. They were really small, just a couple leaves. And within a couple of months or so, this plant has grown all the way up this little moss pole that I have going on right now. And I, it's not a perfectly attached growth. I still have to use some little pins to, to attach it. And so um, a lot of our moss poles come with these little kind of metal pins and you can always use some other wire. I use bonsai wire a lot of times or other kinds of wires like that. Um, you can even use paper clips if you're really clever. And you can use this to actually go in and create a little kind of hook that will pull the plant back to the surface. And when there is a contact of the back of the leaf, which is where all the root system is growing on this, on this little kind of vine, it has a lot of roots in the back. When that is attached to a surface and there's water that actually comes through that area, the, the roots will grow. Roots always grow towards water. And so if you are hydrating the, the pole or the whatever kind of growing medium you have growing up, if you have water in that area, you'll have an attachment. And so that will actually create a little more structure, the plant will attach. And then a lot of times um, it'll actually grow a lot bigger. So before I get into that, I just wanna show you my general method because everyone likes to see a, a little bit of method. I have my water bottle right here. You come in and I just do a really kind of blanket spray of water on the moss that I have growing up or have on the pole. And so what I'm doing right now is just really basically hydrating it. I'm just getting the moss a little bit wet. And so what happens is when the moss is a little bit more wet, like I said, the water can actually move through it a lot easier. 
And then you can even come into, if you feel like you actually need to water a lot more, you can kind of go on the top and water down the pole and the water will stick, it'll stick to itself a lot more. So it'll actually stick to the pole and cascade down and hydrate the soil as well as the, the growing medium that you're growing up on a lot more. Um, I find that really, really helpful, especially with some of these, I'll show you, I'm gonna pull you over here. Some of these other plants I have. So again, this is another one of my Rafa de Foros right here. Um, it's another baby from the same plant. So I actually got a whole bunch of them all at once. And I was able to, I just spray the, the sphagnum moss on the pole. And that allows the roots to attach to the pole a lot easier. And then I can even water a little bit heavier with a watering can if I need to. We also sell a lot of these poles. I showed this plant last time. Um, this is a Monstera adersonii. They're really pretty venestrated or fenestrated Monstera leaves. But these moss poles are rounded and it's really hard to actually just water them with a watering can and hydrate the pole. So I come in pretty consistently and I will go through and spray the pole all the way down. Not really worrying too much about the leaves. You can spray the leaves a little bit. They definitely like it, but I'm really just trying to spray the pole where all the roots are growing. So that way that they attach a lot better. And I am so very surprised with how well these, it's gonna be hard to see, but how well some of these roots are actually attached to the pole. Um, I thought that it was gonna be really kind of loose and not very well attached, but they grew in. So it just shows that if you are consistent with your hydration of your moss poles, there you go. Uh, with the hydration of your moss poles, then you will actually be able to um, get a lot of growth going. So. Hey Taylor, again. before you put that away, yeah. can I ask you a quick question? That spiral yeah. there that's holding the um, the air plant. Yeah. <laughs> please do tell. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, um, again, like I said, I use a lot of bonsai wire because I do a lot of bonsai work. And I find that if you want to spruce up your uh, climbing plants and all your uh, plants on moss poles, and a lot of times when you first plant a plant on them, they're all the leaves are at the very bottom of the pole. And then you just have a really long pole just sitting there um, right. that you have to wait for a, a year or so for the plant to grow up. I make a little spiral out of wire and then I run it through my Talanzias and they create a little Talanzia kind of holder. Just, and I just stick them on all my plants. Okay, They're kind of cute, right? <laughs> Nina here. We're gonna, um, I guess, Taylor, this will be your retirement plan. This right here, this is genius. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so if you're, if you're trying to find interesting ways to use Talanzias and you wanna have more height in your room, uh, I suggest doing little spirals out of wire. It's kind of fun to do. Um, but thank you, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm just gonna quickly talk about care about this plant because I definitely wanted to mention all the different things that other than just growing it up a pole and using water, but um, the raphidophoras are a plant that actually doesn't need a whole bunch of light. I actually had it growing right in my south facing window for a good while. And it, I saw that the growth was getting a little bit more yellowing. It was not as happy. It was getting a little bit too much sun. And it was, I think honestly, it was just drying out too fast um, because when it's in a really bright spot, all that water just gets kind of evaporated really quickly and kind of goes through the water really fast. And so the plant gets really dry. And like I said, when, when there's not a lot of water in that area, not a lot of roots actually get the growing and it slows it down. So I've actually pulled my plants. I put them here for my display of my last class. And they're doing so much better here that I just kind of left them. So they're a little bit farther away from my windows, maybe about six or seven feet from my window. Um, it's a very bright room, but it's also not right in the direct sunlight. And they seem to be doing a lot better than they were before. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of the kind of heart-shaped leaves, the pothos, the philodendrons, all those kinds of more tropical looking, very green growth plants. They seem to do a little bit better with a moderate amount of bright light rather than a lot, a lot of heavy sunlight. And of course, they don't really want too little light. So I find that right in the middle is really good. And they're doing a lot better right here. Um, also, because they're growing up something, I have them back. I have them where I can see the growth and they're growing 
they're against the wall so I can actually see the growth instead of right against the window where all I see is the back of the plank and then that's just not as fun so that's another thing I've thought about when trying to create my my little oasis and my display in my room is how the plants are going to grow and am I actually going to see the growth or that, am I just blocking it because I'm putting it in front of the window um watering wise I water them about I want to say every week and a half I will actually fully water the soil um but probably about twice a week or so I'll go and look at them they're really pretty plants so I definitely like check them out and I'll spray and mist the growing medium like the moss on the pole because I feel like um that stuff dries out very quickly and if I consistently water it I've gotten a lot better uh, root attachment and root growth growing up the plant and so something I started to allude to earlier is when the plant is growing up something it gets a lot of structure and a lot of stability and it's a very amazing thing that I've uh, had a lot of people talk about where if the plant has a growing medium that grows up on it has structure and it's a plant that vines up something once it actually has that strength it will start to produce its more mature leaves and so i have another plant here um, it's on my plant list i tried to put all the plants i was going to talk about on my plant list so if you want to see the names this one is a raftophora as well it's a raftophora decursiva um, they're also called the dragon tail plant because they have this really really cool fenestration where it actually looks like this like trident or multiple leafed uh, dragon's tail and this is another plant that grows very quickly and it grows up it wants to grow up on something if you don't give it that it grows weirdly sideways again <laughs> um, i had this little plank right here that it's growing up and all of its roots are really attached it, it really does attach to the surface very well and it grows up and i've noticed that if it was actually growing on something it pretty immediately grew these large beautiful fenestrated leaves before this i just had a very normal looking spade shaped leaves that were maybe about that small um at the very bottom and that's how i bought the plant i didn't even realize that it was going to do this until after i got it and i started growing it and then suddenly i looked it up and it was like these mature leaves are beautiful and they actually even get way bigger than this in their natural environment but the only way to get the mature leaves is to actually have it growing on a surface that it's able to grow up and get stability from growing up so a lot of these plants will do that um i have another one that i showed earlier the pothos cebu blue it's a really popular one a little while ago people have been uh kind of cultivating it and growing it for a little while now um it's a really cute little pothos um it's i think in the epipyramidum epipyramidum family of them um but it's a plant that has really nice small leaves and I was going to just have it trailing but I've learned that similar to a lot of these other plants like the decursiva if you actually grow it up onto something the leaves go into their more mature growth stage which will form larger more robust leaves have a really cool look to them so I am interested in propagating this um, and actually growing it up and seeing if I can get some more mature leaves it happens also with the Monstera um, deliciosa, which is a plant that I'm sure many, many of you and many people who grow plants have. Everyone kind of get the Monstera because they're beautiful. They grow so large. You really want those huge leaves and fenestrations or the cuts on them or little holes throughout them. Um, and you want those really beautiful leaves. But again, to actually really produce those beautiful leaves, you need to have it growing with a little bit more support and a little bit growing up. Monsteras do it naturally anyway, but they do get huge, beautiful leaves if you actually have a large moss pole. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the moss poles that we sell in the store are around this size, and I'm going to actually show you how to use one. I'm going to plant a plant up and onto one. Um, but a monstera or some of those really, really large specimens, they need like a totem, uh, like, a, like a huge plank or a moss totem, which sounds awesome. And I don't have, uh, and I would love to see actually one really done well um, but at the moment my plant just kind of grows out and becomes a big bush and I don't get as many large leaves but I'm okay with that um, but if you're searching for that you do need to have some sort of larger growing surface for them to grow up on because mature leaves are very different I've noticed that a lot of a lot of these house plants a lot of these beautiful tropical plants they have multiple life stages and they really can get um, they can really start growing in those different kinds of like leaf stages uh, depending on the care you give them so again if you're looking for a really beautiful shiny plant that has some fun fenestrations and you want to have it growing up something definitely check out any of the raffidophoras and the decursiva is probably one of my favorites 
last little thing I wanted to show off is I have this yellow leaf right here and that was on purpose. I was about to take it off last night to kind of spruce up all my plants to show off, but I thought it's a really good learning mechanism to show off that not all your plants are gonna always have the beautifulest greenest leaves all the time. Every plant, every leaf, every flower, they all have a lifespan uh, and you can't have them going forever. So I know that this plant actually did go through a little bit of bug damage a couple months ago. I think I found spider mites on it. It was either spider mites or scale. I believe it was spider mites. I treated it. I used some, um, I think I used some horticultural spray as well as maybe some insecticidal soap, which are just kind of sprays. If you ever go and you need some help with uh, bug problems, we can help you with that in our stores. But I sprayed it down, cleaned it off. It's definitely doing fine right now. I have no bugs on it, but I did notice that this leaf was yellowing first. This is the bottom most leaf on this stalk. And the thing about a lot of plants are if you have a leaf yellowing, and I always tell us people when they come to our store and they are worried about their plants, if the, the leaf that is yellowing is your oldest or most mature or lowest down leaf, it's generally just the plant's response to some sort of stress or a natural death of, the, of that part of the plant. It's gonna slowly keep on growing itself up and it doesn't need this leaf anymore. So it's actually taking away its energy and letting it go yellow. Um, it's yellowing pretty naturally. It's not too bad. And the nice thing is it's really easy to take off these plants. You kind of just like give it a little bit of a bend, do a little bit of a snap. I know that's kind of scary sounding. You can definitely give it a snip, um, but a lot of times these plants you can just kind of snap them off and it will heal over pretty fast and it will keep on growing up. So I just wanted to show you that not all plants are always green and a yellow leaf is totally fine. It's something that you have to deal with as a plant care person. Um, let's drop that back here. Um, so uh, I wanna do two things before I actually start repotting. Again, let's talk about trimming and propagation. I just trimmed off that yellow leaf, right? But I also have this plant again that has this growth on top that is coming over the edge and going lateral. I, at this point, would love to transplant or love to propagate this one even more. So we're gonna turn up. I'm gonna get my little snips. These are great snips. All the snips that we sell are wonderful, but these are nice, small, very sharp. I'm just gonna come in. and snip off the plant right near the top. You see, that was all that new growth that I actually got. I trimmed this plant a little while ago and that's how I got some of my, my um, propagations I showed you. But if you check out the back of this leaf, if I can actually get to focus on it, there are little bumps going all the way along. And those are the, the root little nodules or areas that the roots are gonna grow out of and attach to the plant. So that's just showing that this plant is ready to attach to something. But right now it was kind of loose and looking for a new thing to grow on. Um, the cool thing about it is since there's already roots growing, this plant's really easy to propagate. You just kind of snip each section. So I'm gonna cut another piece off. Ooh. Name one, little one. And if I just put that into A little container, I have a little Tupperware of moss, and you almost just lay it on the surface, kind of tuck it in there, give it a good hydration, sometimes even put a lid on this to um, create some humidity as well, because humidity is just water in the air, and if there's water in the air, that means that the roots are going to want to grow, so it's going to cause them to grow a little bit more. And I'm just going to cut them up, and I'm going to lay them all inside this Tupperware for maybe, I want to say, maybe two months or so before you really start seeing new growth. It'll happen over time. Um, and sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower, the more humidity uh, and the, if you keep up on your watering, see, quite easy, um, the faster that you'll get new growth. And the new growth will look like the little leaves I had on my, on my propagation plants. They're just gonna start to grow out. And then as they attach, they're gonna get bigger and larger and more beautiful. And then you're gonna have this nice growing plant that's called the shingles plant because it's gonna look, look, look like shingles. All right. Again, quick propagation. This is sphagnum moss. I love sphagnum moss. I use it quite often. 
Um, it comes in different kinds of containers. This is from Supermoss um, and we sell them at our stores. So if you are doing a lot of propagation projects or you're working with orchids or you're working with any kinds of plants like that, um, get a bag for yourself. It's really helpful. All right. I think we're doing pretty good on time and I really want to spend a little bit more time actually planting up a plant and then uh, utilizing a moss pool because I think um, it's a daunting project. A lot of people will buy a really pretty trailing plant and they want to actually grow it on a pole, but then they have to figure out how they plant it, how do you attach it, are they doing it properly, do they need to trim the plant? There's a lot of questions that I get around actually utilizing um, this kind of moss pole method. So I thought, why not take this moment to do it ourselves? All right, this is the plant we're going to be using today. It is a Scandopsis pictus. Many of you might know it. it is the satin pothos. Really pretty dark leaves with these little splotches of silver all throughout them. The back of the leaf is kind of like a silvery green. They're also very almost velvety soft um, and very thick for a pothos. There's a lot of different kinds of pothos. There's the um, Scandapsis and the Ampiprimnums are like the main families or genuses that people talk about. And this one is a really nice satiny kind of uh, texture. I've also noticed that it attaches to things really well. I have one growing in the corner of my room and I kind of forget about it. They don't mind going a little bit more dry, which is a really nice thing about this plant. It doesn't mind being a little bit in the shadier part of the room, kind of in the corner, not really getting any direct sunlight. And it has attached to my walls and other plants around it a whole bunch. So it just shows that this plant loves to climb and grab onto things. So I thought it'd be a perfect specimen for our moss pole experiment. We sell them a lot of times in these hanging baskets. Just as a tip, this is not fully attached or this is not permanent. You can definitely take off the hanging attachment and have this sitting on your counter. I do get that question quite often is, does this have to be a hanging plant? A plant's a plant. You can grow it wherever you feel like you can grow it. You can have this sitting on a counter or you can have this hanging, definitely fine. We're gonna have it sitting in a pot on a moss pole. So definitely shows up. Now let's see if I can get a nice angle on this project. Taylor, can I ask you something while you're absolutely what's up setting there? So the uh, the plastic container that you just were showing for the propagation is that <laughs> true for is that true for I guess what what types of plants are there only certain plants that you can use in that style? We have um, um yeah. we have somebody watching that's asking about specifically like monstera and maranta. And I have a philodendron, I have a painted lady that um so you know, just wondering yeah. like what styles, is it only styles that have small leaves like that? So a little a little more info on what you can which yeah. plants will follow that it's propagation a great question. style. Um, because um, you can definitely try with a lot of different plants. Any plant that can propagate through um, through root growth in like a water, like a lot of times we talk about putting plants inside a water glass and having them grow their roots out there are pretty, you can grow them probably in a container with moss as well. I find that a lot of plants that have a little bit thicker leaves or vining plants do wonderful inside these little terrarium boxes almost. Um, so all the pothos, all the philodendrons, all of the hoyas or the marantas, I'm just saying names now. <laughs> um, there's a lot of those plants that are like these trailing kind of tropical plants. They do great inside these boxes. I know that you can grow a lot of them in water too, but I've noticed that some, especially like this one where it's really flat, I couldn't really stick this into water very easily, but because I can kind of stick it over the soil like this, it does great. Um, I'm sure you could even grow some of the succulents and some of those other kinds of plants in this system, but they do have a different water requirement and they can rot out or get a little bit too soggy too fast. So you have to kind of be careful of that. Um, it's a great propagation method. I've seen it a lot more recently. People just snipping all their house plants, all their different kinds of plants that they have in their area, putting them inside. This is a really small box and even larger boxes um, that have a clear kind of plastic outside so it still gets a lot of light but it has a lid and it actually creates a nice humidity zone so um yeah i would say just try with whatever you have and um if it's if it has a vine or it has a stem that can grow roots it will work great uh if it's a very woody plant or it's a plant that just grows from the base like maybe a palm 
it would be harder to start in here. You can't propagate palms or some of those plants from leaf cuttings. Uh, you have to do it from like a bulb or a, a part of the bottom of the, bottom of the plant or, or splitting the plant up. And that would work a little bit differently. So I think if the plants can't grow from a root cutting or a leaf or a stem cutting, then uh, they wouldn't be able to grow in the box very easily. Do you have to be able to see those little nodes, the little root, um, you know, the little root bumps on the side? You don't have to see them, but okay. you have to kind of know that they're going to be there. Most plants, even like these ones, will have a little one just already Got forming. It. Um, but there are a couple varieties that really don't form those as much. I think the marantas and some of the other plants like that won't really have as much visible root growth unless they have a lot of humidity in the air, or a lot of water. So I think um, mostly, yes, you'll see them, but sometimes not as much. And you can definitely ask your garden members or even look up online the plant's name um, and it'll tell you about their like kind of growth style. Um, but yeah, good question. If you have more, let us know. I'm going to go into this pot right here because I just want to do a quick talk about choosing containers. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of pottery. There is pottery that we consider indoors or outdoors. It's all pottery. It all works anywhere. It just depends on the, the weight of the pot and actually how it grows in it. Um, this is a plastic style pot, so it will retain water pretty well. It's not going to uh, leach out water like a terracotta pot. Anything that's terracotta or clay will actually slowly pull water from the plants on all sides. It's great for having good aeration and good drainage, but also it can dry out your plants a little bit faster. And I've noticed that I have a couple of indoor plants that I have in terracotta and they dry out far too fast. So just knowing that sometimes a plastic pot or something like this will hold your water a little bit better. A terracotta will be a little bit more dry. Um, if you're growing in like a moss ball, of course it dries very quickly. Um, and if you're, growing in like a glazed terracotta pot. It's kind of like medium, the glaze does keep in some water, but does have a little bit of leaching. So I chose this pot because I think it has a nice, really a nice color to it. Uh, it has a really good size because I wanted to have a moss pole sitting on the inside with a plant growing all the way around it. So I wanted to be big enough for this growth style that I'm gonna go for. Another cool thing about this pot, which not a lot of pots have, and it's not really a way I plant often, but it has a false bottom which is this little grate at the bottom that will actually uh, hold the soil a little bit above a reservoir of water at the bottom, um, which I think is really great if it has a hole still. It has this little hole here that has a plug, uh, which is great because it will hold the water for a little bit, allow the plant to pull up a little bit more water if it still needs it, but I can also unplug it and flush out the excess water. Um, you never really want to plant into a pot that has no drainage. No drainage will cause um, the fastest way to get root rot. And ro root rot really is, is the soil becoming very dense or, or drenched in water. So it has a lot of water inside of it. And then the plants use up all the oxygen in the water and the, the, all the roots are pulling away oxygen because plants, just as I let you know, they respire as well. So they breathe, uh, they do photosynthesis, but they also do respiration and they use that oxygen. And so if they're, all the oxygen gets pulled out of the soil by the root system and it's still a lot of water in there, it just becomes very anaerobic, which is like a bog style of growing. Um, and you'll start to smell and that's how you get root rot. So just me as a disclaimer, do not plant in, in pots that don't have a drainage hole or a way for you to drain water out. This is great because it's kind of the best of both worlds. It keeps the water in when you want to, but you can unplug it and keep and pull the water out when you need to. Get rid of all those salts and all those minerals um, before they build up and become a problem. Um, another nice thing about this pot is it's a little bit higher sided. So my nice big moss pole has a good amount of space for it to sit in. And when I put soil and all the plant inside of it around this pole, it's going to be sturdy. Uh, a very shallow pot with a large moss pole, you can imagine, uh, is going to be very top heavy. And any movement or anything like that will cause it to fall over, topple over, rip the soil out of your pot. It can be a, a big mess if you do it improperly. So. When you do use a pole or something like this, having enough root space or a soil space for it to sit in will create the stability for the, the pole. Um, I'm also going to use this soil, indoor potting soil. It says it in the name. It's really easy. You can use it for your indoors. You can absolutely use this stuff outdoors or in other situations. It's just a name to kind of help give you an idea of where you can use it. Indoor potting soil that we sell at Sloat is high drainage. So it's a, it's a soil that has a lot of rockiness, a lot more of um, 
more uh, bark and those kinds of compounds that are very coarse uh, and allows the water to run through it really easily. It soaks up the water, but releases the water really easily as well. So it's not super sticky or very, um, very hydration, like it has a lot of hydration, like some of the other stuff. Um, organic pine soil or other kinds of soils that we sell work great, honestly, for house plants. They can definitely work out, but sometimes they retain too much water or um, there's other issues around there. So I'm going to use the indoor potting soil today. Snip off the top. Um, I mean, it just looks like soil to, uh, on the camera, but it really has these nice little chunks of rock. I see some chunks of bark. Um, it's a little bit on the sandier side. It's nice and dark and kind of like smells nice like soil, doesn't smell bad or rancid or anything like that. I don't see any bugs coming out of the bag. There were, we sterilize all of our bags. And there are usually never any problems, but it's always good, especially if you've had a soil bag for a long time, sitting in your garage or wherever it is, and you open it up, make sure there's no bugs or anything walking out of it, that'll be a problem. <laughs> um, all right. Pot. I'm gonna put a small layer Small layer of soil to start with, right? Just enough to give me a base for my moss pole. The cool thing about these moss poles are um, it's made out of PVC pipe. Uh, this, this variety is, there's a lot of different varieties, but this one's made out of PVC pipe. So I'm gonna be able to stick it in. The soil is gonna grab the center and be around it um, and be pretty nice and sturdy. down. All right. Now this is if you had any starter fertilizers or um, a rich or like a transplant fertilizers like sure starch or anything you'd add it into your soil right now. I don't have any around me right now. So I'm not going to do it, but I can always fertilize it later. This is when you actually add some fertilizer in around your, your soil level. Now the fun part. Let's play with the plant. So Again, this is a satin pothos. Um, the Epiprimnum or Skindopsis pictus. Pictus? Smell that? Um, I have it on my list. They are really easy to grow, and I have a couple around my house. And I've done cuttings and propagations of them all the time. So uh, if you'd like a plant that is fun to grow, easy to make friends, and you know, give them to your all your your buddies, then this is a good one to go for. All right, I'm going to pull out the pot. A tip for anyone that is pulling out of these little pots, get your hand in inside, have your fingers around all the vines or the stems coming out of the soil. You can flip it upside down. I was getting soil on my floor, but I'll vacuum after, it's all good. Give a little bit of a squeeze, just massage the roots so they come undone without really hurting them. And then it pops it right out. So. Look how beautiful that is. Really nice a layer of winding roots, which just shows that this plant has been growing in this pot for a good while. It is well established. It is not really new. It's not, not, um, it's not a plant that just doesn't have any roots on it, but it's also not so dense with roots that it's overly root bound. At that point, it would be a little bit harder for me to actually transplant it and get into a new pot. It's gonna be all wound up and it needs a lot more time to open up, but this is a perfect timing for this plant. Um, you can also see that some of the roots are fuzzier. Some of them are kind of winding around. That's just all the little root hairs. They're able to pull in water really easily. They're gonna spread out. They're probably also attached to a whole mycorrhizae organism. So there's a lot of funguses in our soil. Fungus is definitely a thing that helps out plants. So the mycorrhizae attached to the root layer, spreads out the surface area of the uptake of nutrients and water for the plants and makes them a lot healthier in the long run. That's what's really good about Sure Start too, is it adds more mycorrhizae to your soil. All right, so the one thing I actually want to do is I want to get around the pole. So I want the plant to actually be growing up around and going up the pole. So I'm going to actually go in here and just gently pull back some of the roots and create a little bit of a hole. I drop things on the ground. <laughs> and just kind of crack it open and then 
place it into the pot around my root ball, around my moss pole. Sorry, it's a little bit harder to see. Play a little closer. Does that look pretty good, Shannon? Yep, that's perfect, Taylor. So right now, being very gentle, I am just unwinding all these stems that are all <laughs> tied together. This is a very vigorous plant that has a lot of energy in it already. So you want to be gentle, but they are pretty sturdy too. So you don't have to be too cautious. And now I am just going to spread it out around the, the pole, get it nice and sturdy. And now at this point, it might be a little bit hard to see, a little bit mess, but I have the roots going mostly maybe two thirds of the way around the, the pole. That way I can actually start to build up and grow the plant up the pole um, and not have it all centered in the front of the pot or anything like that. So it is pretty stable there. And I'm going to, instead of just pouring the soil into the, the pot, which works out, but sometimes just grabbing another pot or a shovel or whatever you have, taking a scoop out of your soil and then just filling in. Now, do we have any questions that uh, are burning anyone you know, Like if any, anyone's coming in right now? Yes. So I had one really good question and I was even looking it up while we are uh, sitting here asking about like native suggestions for house plants. Um, oh. I know I, I, I'm not often totally stumped on a question. I mean, I know that there are some native plants that I'm sure there are. Yeah, would probably. And to be grow. honest, mm -hmm. I can't think of too many. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm literally, like I said, I was going online yeah. just to see if there's something that I'm missing. I mean, there's a, there's definitely a few that you can grow inside, but the whole point of the native plants is that they do so well in native soil and are so acclimated to our weather and our soil and our, you know, heat, wind, whatever, that, you know, that's what, that's kind of their strength is their ability to do well in this area. So bringing them yeah. inside and kind of taking them away from that, um, there's nothing that comes to mind that I'm like, oh my God, this one would be great as a house plant. Am I missing something, Taylor? I think the only things I can kind of think of are possibly some ferns that are right. native to the area. Right. Um, because I think the, the biggest problem you run into is um, in a houseplant area or in, a, in, the, in our homes, our temperature is a lot more stagnant right. at a higher level. We don't have as much uh, aeration or like as much water, uh, air movement. We don't get the colder nights. Um, and it's just, it's just a different kind of environment than most of our outdoor area. So most plants are in, that are native to like California are drought tolerant plants. There are definitely some succulents that could probably be brought in, but there's a lot of those like kind of woodier, shrubbier plants that do really well outside that are our native plants, our ceanothus and all those kinds of manzanitas and stuff. You wouldn't really want to bring them inside because the environment in your house is really just not suitable for them. Right. Uh, everything that's growing in our house is pretty much tropical plants from the equator and a few other little ones around. Yeah, I and was. That is why I think. Yeah, ferns, same thing. Maybe. The whole reason that they do well inside is because technically they are not acclimated to outside in our area. Like you said, you know, so many plants from, you know, the island areas, places that are closer to the equator. We get so many, you know, plants from even, you know, Florida, but Hawaii and, you know, the islands outside of there. So many that are coming from Thailand and Fiji and places like that. It, there's just no way to duplicate. Yeah. So if, if you live there and, or you live in any of those locations that we've got house plants from, uh, then absolutely all your native plants are your house plants. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in California, or at least in this area, not so many. And I'm sure there's a couple out there. And if you have some, I would love to hear it and like how well you've done with bringing some plants indoors. But for the most part, there might be some maidenhair ferns that are native. Uh, there might be a few sword ferns that might do well inside. Um, and you can try those, but uh, not as much. <laughs> okay. 
so I'm, I'm just building up the, whenever I uh, pot up plants uh, in these kinds of containers, I usually will raise your soil level to a point where if I put the plant in, it sits at the level that I want it to. So the soil is about this much at the bottom. And then I put the plant in sitting about this much and it's just a little bit below the rim. I never want to plant up right to the rim because then when I water the plant, the water goes off the sides. So you want to have a little bit of water space at the top of your rim. But once you can get your plant settled at that level, then just going in, pouring in soil all the way around in a slow kind of more methodical way, instead of just pouring it on one side, um, I find it's a lot easier because you can kind of slowly tuck it in, make sure all those large holes of air are actually filled with soil or the medium, because if there are really big areas of, um, of or really pocket, big pockets of air, what happens is it fills up with water and the plants do fine. And then that area dries out. And then all those roots that are surrounding that spot get very dry and they can die away. And so pockets of air are never that great inside your soil. Um, you don't wanna completely compact it and make it super dense. That's also a problem. That means less air can actually penetrate and move through your soil. Like again, I was saying anaerobic soils are really bad for plants. That's how you get root rot. So you wanna have good airflow, good water flow, but still a nice kind of even soil, um, more homogeneous soil. You don't wanna have big pockets of, soil, of air. Um, so I'm just moving around, kind of tucking in, using my fingers. If you have a nice smaller shovel or a little uh, kind of other instrument or even like a chopstick or something, you can kind of work the soil in. But I am almost there to a point where I feel that it is nice and sturdy. And now the fun part begins. All right, let's see. So as I mentioned before, I have these little pins. All of our moss poles come with a little packet of pins. And if you don't see it inside your pole, they might've fallen out. So um, check near that display. There might be a little um, container that has all the pins. We have that at our store just because they sometimes fall out. And um, we wanna make sure that you have your little structural pins to, to time up. So as I go around, I'm gonna take a, a full stem and pull it up to where the bottom is actually touching the moss pole. I'm gonna take my pin and I'm just going to stick it around the, let's see, I'm getting a little closer. Hello everyone. I have the, the vine coming through, the pin right here, I'm gonna go in, but I'm not gonna to go too tight. If you come up really close and you tightly push the vine against the side, what will happen is it'll eventually keep on growing um, and the vine will start to get almost like girdled or it'll get uh, cut off. The, the uh, water and the nutrients that are going through it will get slowly taken away because there'll be too much of a blockage and it'll grow almost like around it. So you wanna have a little bit of space so that there is a little bit of movement, the plant, the plant can kind of keep on growing, but it is sturdy enough to now that the root, the roots that are growing out of the stem are actually growing into the side of the pole. And so I'm gonna kind of go around, I'm gonna do a spiral kind of pattern going up because I feel like um, if I just did it straight up from the bottom, I would be at the top of my pole pretty much immediately. So by spiraling it around, I actually increase the surface area, increase the, the um, amount of plant I can have on the pole uh, without it just already being at the top. And then I have to keep on trimming it and doing all those things that we talked about earlier. So I'm gonna spin this one up. I have another little pin. I'm gonna find an area near a root node, not right on it, but near a root node, and then just stick the pin through the sphagnum moss and now the plant's being held up here. I'm gonna do a few more and then I'll, I'll show you again close up what it kind of looks like. Um, and I think it's also another time. Is there some more questions or I can kind of riff off of some other stuff if you have anything? So well, there's there's several questions about, and it's the, it's the house plant that I think all of us struggle with the most are the ficus. Yeah. I feel like ficuses. they should be called fussy ficus. Like they, <laughs> they can be so um, temperamental. And I've had a couple questions about 
um, the elasticas losing leaves, a couple questions about loradas and how to, if there's a way to spur on like new branching, if you have kind of a single trunk variety. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for people that are struggling with, with ficus in general? Yeah, well, first off, like you're saying, you're not alone. Yes. Everyone, <laughs> we all do struggle with that. Um, there's a couple plants and a couple of varieties that people really struggle with. And um, the ficus uh, lorata, which is the fiddle leaf fig, which most people know it as, is very, it was very popular and very widespread um, the last couple of years. And the more that people actually have them now, the more people realize that they are kind of fussy and a little bit harder to take care of. And it doesn't mean that you can't grow it. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't get beautiful. There's, of course, beautiful ones. I actually have uh, some as well, but I've noticed that they, they do react poorly when their conditions are not perfect. <laughs> um, a few things that I can recommend to anyone that is growing one, try and find a nice spot that it can grow and you can leave it. You don't really want to have your plants um, you don't want to move around your ficuses too much. And by moving, I mean like you put it in one space and you move it to another window and then you put it outside and you put it in your back room, and you put it in your front room. A lot of people kind of, like I said, I move around my plants a lot too, but with the ficuses, they like to find a spot, settle and grow their leaves and be happy in that one spot. You can do a bit of a spin to keep the growth a little bit more even. Um, otherwise you get your growth that's growing very sideways. Right. But if you move it around too much, that is one way for the leaves to be a little bit temperamental or leaves to be a little bit upset and they will drop down a little bit more. The other biggest thing is one of our topics today, water yeah. and how you're watering the plant. Um, not all ficuses struggle with this, but I do know like Loradas and a few of the other ones, if they are sitting in too much water, um, actually, if they are sitting in soil and too much water, they can easily um, react poorly and have some sort of root rot action or the roots will die back. They don't like to be like what my, uh, some of my other coworkers say is their feet in, this, in the water. Like you don't wanna just be wading in water. So if you ever water your ficus and you come back to it maybe an hour or an hour and a half later, and there is still water in the saucer or whatever the container it is, that usually means that the soil is fully hydrated and now the plant is actually overly hydrated and doesn't need any more water. So you should dump out the excess water. I've definitely lost a whole bunch of leaves on mine to just kind of overwatering it, not thinking about it, and then letting it sit in a puddle of water for maybe a week and a half or something like that. And I come back and all the leaves become translucent in this kind of weird way. And then they start to get spotchy, you get some brown spots around the sides or in the kind of wing part at the very top of it. And eventually it'll yellow out and they'll fall off. So I think your biggest things are a good location that you don't move it around too much, um, consistent, but um, very mindful watering where you make sure that it doesn't sit in too much water, but it does get fully hydrated. The whole soil needs to be hydrated when you do water it. And then you wanna wait probably like a week to two weeks or something before you even water it again, sometimes even longer than that. Um, and then the other thing you're mentioning is the plant's growing too big. So uh, like I was mentioning before, you want to trim your plants when they get uh, to a size that is maybe a little bit too large or they're outgrowing their pots or they're going, they're going to hit your ceiling. Um, I actually, I'm going to show you after I'm done winding this all up, my ficus elastica and it is doing just that. It is hitting the ceiling of my room. And at this point, I've been prolonging it for very long. I should have trimmed it a while ago, but like everyone else, it feels scary to trim off a huge plant. Um, but when you do actually trim the plant up, um, it will cause a branching pattern to happen from the point that you cut it. So, do I have anything around me? Oh, actually, perfect. Essentially, you have to cut it in order to kind of spur on that branching. Yeah, um, two things happen. So, if the plant gets to a really tall height, so even actually, you know what? We're talking about it. Let's go see it. Yay! Oh, field, field trip, trip. to my ficus. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my Alaska right behind me. It is beautiful. It is large. Her name is Gaia, um, and it is going from a large pack underneath, going all the way up, and then this one's about to hit my ceiling, and oh this one gosh. hit my ceiling a good while ago. 
Taylor. He's going to the corner. Right? You can see that, right? Lovely. <laughs> so it is amazing. And I actually have leaves going all the way up because I found that if you have it sitting in a spot where light is hitting the entire plant, it is a lot easier to keep your lower leaves. If you just have light at the top, maybe a couple feet of the plant, that's where your leaves are going to grow. So in any plant across the board, if the light is only hitting part of the plant, that's most likely where your growth is going to be. And it's not going to be around the rest of the plant. Um, so I've been growing this one up. I've actually noticed right, let's see if I can show it. Uh, right here, there's a branch. So the branch that's hitting my ceiling is this one right here. Ah. And then this is my branch that's growing up. So it got tall enough to the point where it knew, <laughs> and as well as plants know, that it had to start branching out because otherwise it's gonna grow out of its light level. So it's growing above the light right now here. So it, it branched out here to get more dense growth in the area that would get light. So I feel like if you do have a plant that is growing really large, um, you might get some branching at the top, but if you cut it, it actually forces that to happen a little bit more. So if, you, if I came in and cut this branch somewhere here, the nodes, the leaf nodes that were beneath it are where you're actually get your branch to come out of. You can see right here, this leaf, right, right above it is where the branch is coming out because that is where the branch actually grows from is right above the leaf node. So if I cut this tree even lower down here, where am I at? There we go. If I cut the leaf right here, this next leaf node will probably be the first one to grow and then maybe one or two beneath it will also get growth. And that's how you actually cause a more tree-like pattern to your, your ficuses. Um, so it, it does come from trimming them. But the few things about trimming a ficus, and I was actually gonna do one today, but I don't really think I have the time. And also it's a little bit messy because uh, ficuses have a sap on the inside of them. Uh, it is a, I think it's made out of uh, latex kind of material, um, but it's that white kind of milky sap. So when you cut the ficus, it'll start to spill out a bunch of this white kind of fluid that is a little bit on the, the sticky side. It's also a little bit uh, in irritant to our skin. So you have to be careful if you are trimming your ficuses. If you get it on your skin to wash them off right away, don't get it anywhere near your eyes, don't eat it, anything like that. Um, it is also why they're slightly toxic to animals. Um, if you have a cat that is scratching up your ficus and getting the milk coming out of it, don't let it, drink, don't let it uh, lick that up or your dog or anything like that. It is a little bit of a toxin. Um, but if you cut your plants, you have to cap it off. I will use like a paper towel or some sort of, um, just something to kind of hold in and capture a little bit of that liquid as it kind of spews out. And then it's gonna cap off and callus over. And once that callus over happens, you're gonna start getting your growth to happen. So that's my biggest tips for them. Careful your watering, be careful with your lighting, trim them when you need to, be careful to sap. <laughs> Does that kind of help out, hopefully? Absolutely. Uh, and just so you you guys know that uh, ficus, they, they can be temperamental. So you're, you're not alone. You're not a bad plant mommy and or daddy. Um, they just can be kind of fussy. And there's lots of different varieties of ficus. And, and I find that there are some that are a little tougher than others that might be a yeah. little less fussy. I have a ficus Ali that I just love and I, I don't have to fool with it very often. A ficus Audrey, also those um, pretty easy, the yellow gems, you know, there's, yeah. there's that are not quite as susceptible to you know, any problems. Yes. I think actually out of all of them, um, I really like the ficus elasticas or the ficus decoras or a few different names for them, but the rubber right. trees. Yeah. They seem and um they seem to be the sturdiest of the large ficuses that we have. The fiddly figs are beautiful and they can do well, but they have a little bit more of that finickiness. They get their brown leaves a little bit faster. The Benjaminas are the um this is a Type of Benjamina, it's a midnight one. They're the, the ficuses with the little leaves. Yeah. So ficuses with little leaves are also, they grow really well, they get nice and bushy, but they will drop their leaves easily. If anything happens, if the temperature changes really harshly or you don't water it properly, it'll drop all of its leaves. And it's because I've actually told many people that ficuses are figs, right? So it's a fig plant. We have figs growing in our outdoor area um, that are producing actual figs on them, but our indoor ones are 
still in the same family and the family's natural response to stress or damage or time of the year is to drop their leaves. Figs outside are deciduous. So figs indoors are maybe not as deciduous, but they will, if anything happens, they'll drop their leaves first and then they can grow the back of their leaves really easily, but you right. do get that leaf drop. Yeah. Yeah. I have had quite a few Benjaminas break my heart and, and litter the floor. It is a, it's a tough thing to, to see. All right. Well, I also am about at the point where I'm happy with this wiring up and I wanted to at least show it off. Um, so that you've been seeing me, you've been seeing me kind of just like weave this, these leaves around. Let me get this last stem in here. Yeah. So let's see what's a good lighting. I have the plant here. It's now very dense at the bottom because a lot of the growth was coming up, but you can see the root systems are just popping out of the soil Great. and then it's moving up and then inside I have a bunch of different little pins holding them against the, the side of the moss pole right. going all the way up to the very top where I just have one or two that's going to be my high point so it's going to give me some nice upward growth up here. Um, it's going to keep on growing up. I didn't trim any of the branches so when you trim a vining branch it'll usually keep on growing out um, and I could definitely keep, take cuttings from this to make some propagations but I just wanted to have a nice full beautiful look to it um and now like i was mentioning before for watering where's my there it is and we're probably near the end of the class too um, i have my watering bottle here <laughs> i just go in and i hydrate up let's pull you back close where, where am I okay so you're just getting the pole mostly i'm giving the pole a lot of moisture because uh, it's maybe hard to see, but it immediately, sphagnum moss immediately will soak up water and start getting more malleable right. and actually hold the water there for a little while. And that allows the plant to attach to it. Right now, they're only being held there by my, <laughs> by my little pins, but within a couple of weeks or so, I bet that they will actually have a camera. <laughs> uh, they'll have a nice amount of growth. <laughs> That's awesome. um, and then I'm going to, it's always good whenever you transplant your plant to water your soil. Um, you don't really want to transplant and then leave it in a drier soil. It's just good to give it a good water, get it set up, and then let it sit for a couple of days and then inspect it. It's always good. I know we a lot of times will say come back once a week or whatever your, your watering right. schedule is. When you have a new plant, that's your new baby. You want to come back and check on it every once in a while, a little bit more often. See how the roots are doing. See if the soil is getting really wet or really dry really quickly. Um, see if there's any kind of weird stuff happening. If there's some pockets of soil that got really like low because there's maybe some, right. some compaction happening, you can kind of readjust that. So it's always good to come back and check on your newly planted plants. Um, but does, that doesn't mean water them consistently. So every time you check on them, doesn't mean you have to water them. Sure. Yeah. Well, that looks beautiful, I, Taylor. That's awesome. I'm pretty happy. Yeah, yeah not I, bad at I'm, all. And it's really easy. It feels so daunting. And when you see them come from the growers and they look so perfect, it's like, okay, I guess I'm going to have to order a new one. But knowing, you know, there's a really easy way to do it yourself, that's great. Yeah. So I hope that, that inspires everyone to um, grow some of their cool plants, growing them up. I mean, the beginning of this class, again, like we talked about, was creating an oasis. I thought when I when creating an oasis was to have plants everywhere, to have plants growing in different heights and different locations. I really was excited to show off at least using a moss pole because I feel like it's a really good task and a really good um, growing style, but it's a little bit scary sometimes. Yes. Um, we have these all in all of our stores. So we have different kinds of poles. We have this one. We also have the green poles. We have some little pole trellises. I know that we have new ones coming that are apparently yes. bendable, which is really exciting. Like um, we don't have them just yet. Yeah. Um, and then we have a lot of these plants. The Some of the easiest plants to grow, the pothos and the philodendrons, the ones that we always have in our stores are the ones that actually grow so well on these moss poles. And so if you want a little bit of height in your room without getting a big tree like the ficus we just looked at, it's a great option. 
Um, I'm actually going to be bringing this to our store to put it on stock and have it sold. So if you see it in, in slow, on Slow Boulevard, there's one that I planted. <laughs> and it's if it does really well, maybe I'll do more. Get in there and get the, the one that Taylor put together for us. <laughs> yeah. you, um, you mentioned in your outline that one of your questions was, you know, what kind of classes and what kind of things people might like to see next time. Um, yeah. There have been a bundle of questions just on the whole idea of propagating and how to propagate and which plants are propagated with water and which are propagated with this and which are yeah. better. So not that we have time to get into it today, but just know that going forward, there seems to be a lot of interest um, of being able to propagate your own and just feeling comfortable knowing that you have the right materials, supplies, what to kind of look yeah. for, what the expectation is. That's so great to hear. It's definitely what I kind of push towards in my classes. I am a avid propagator. I, I've talked about it in pretty much every one of my houseplant classes of what to do with that. Um, because I think it's really fun to make more from your plants that you're growing, especially because you're gonna have to trim them anyway. Might as well get used to that, those trimmings. Uh, I would love to do a class a little bit more focused on that. And I'll, we'll talk with the, our team about those um, yes. as an idea. Uh, but there's definitely yeah, a lot of topics out there that we can talk about. So. Um, come into our store, let our staff know, email us, um, all those kinds of things will help create a better and more uh, more fun uh, webinars. I mean, yeah. we'll be filling our YouTube page with these different classes. Um, hopefully more kind of tips and tricks will be coming along as well. So. For sure. Yeah. And it's nice to know that because then we can focus them better on what, you know, the topics and questions and stuff that people are, you know, still kind of struggling with. I'm, I'm another one that's not the most comfortable with propagating, same reasons, not really sure what to use. And there's so many goodies out there. So I, that would be a great class all around, I would imagine. Cool. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I think that we've answered all the questions, um, tons of good information there. Taylor, you did an amazing job of showing all kinds of different supplies and things that you can use and different yeah. ways of, of doing things. So this was this was super helpful. Thank you. Um, appreciate you guys tuning in today. I know we went a little bit long. Sorry about that. Hopefully we got all of the questions. And I know that we can't always answer everything exactly to the specification of the plant that you have and the issue that you're having. But feel free to reach out to us. You know, either give one of us a call at our stores. Taylor is at, as I mentioned, the Slo uh, Boulevard store in San Francisco. I am at the Diablo store in Danville. Um, we are excited to take any of your questions by email or by telephone. You can always um, put in your questions on our website to the garden guru and they can either answer them directly or they send them out to the stores if there's any, you know, anything specific to location. So lots of ways to get your questions answered if we don't hit everything on these webinars. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited about the lineup that's coming. Definitely check this, uh, web this webinar out on our website. Um, as of Tuesday, it will be uploaded. And thank you guys for joining us. You know, be careful out yeah. there this weekend. Enjoy this rain. Thank you so much, Taylor. Appreciate all the info. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. And again, all, for all of you joining us today and everyone watching this in the future, hopefully it helps you out and um, get some good ideas going. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, you guys have a great weekend. Yeah, Go until next time. Yeah, take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.